Professor Geim gave us an excellent discussion of the uh, basic physics of graphene. I'm going to focus on applications, applications of graphene in electronics and optoelectronics. From the physics that we've heard, uh, they're all important, but I wanted to stress one important point uh, for electronic devices, and that uh, involves the Klein tunneling that we heard, uh, because it affects the most important property of today's electronic devices, namely the confinement of electrons by electrostatic means. And we start with graphene, let's say it's endoped electron carriers. And then we apply a gate field, so we produce a p-type section on the graphene. And then on the other side, we have the electron, again, n-type graphene. So we have an n, p, n type of junction. Uh, we heard about uh, pseudospin, which, like real spin, is conserved. Uh, in this situation, we have zero bunk up graphene. So it's a case of tunneling without a gap. And it conserves pseudospin, which is, again, you don't actually need the pseudospin. Uh, it is based on the orthogonality of the pi and pi star wave functions of graphene. So an electron from the conduction band on the end side can very nicely tunnel conserving pseudospin into the velus band of this section and exit again in the conduction band on the other electrode. So we go back to this uh, gapless interband tunneling has been described a long time ago and used actually in semiconductors. Incident electrons on a barrier that's very sharp, as indicated here, uh, would lead to full transmission. This is the basis also of the absence of backscattering in graphene. Uh, other directions of electrons incident on the barrier will be reflected. And what the actual transmission coefficient would be depends very much on the shape of this barrier. The sharper the barrier, the easier the transmission, up to 100% transmission. Uh, as a result, you cannot confine electrons by electrostatic means, by a long range potential. Uh, so, uh, if I look at the next slide, if we look at the current versus voltage, gate voltage of a field effect device, we get the characteristic V shape by V. This is because graphene is an ampipolar device that is depending on what kind of bias we apply on the gate. We can either have hole or electron conduction. But the most important consequence uh, is because of the client tunneling, the gate can never turn off completely the current. There will always be a leakage. And of course, this is very essential because if you cannot turn off the device, you cannot have a digital switch. So you cannot do what, say, silicon does, or gallium arsenide, or other conventional semiconductors. Uh, typically, the neutrality point uh, is shifted from zero gate bias. And that's, again, because, as Professor Guy mentioned, the existence of electron hole puddles the fact that the insulator supporting the graphene has trapped charges, and that gives rise to the minimum conductance, which again is a function of the trapped charges in the substrate. So the substrate has a very profound r effect on the gating uh, characteristics of graphene. Uh, a different view that uh, engineers have in describing graphene is actually that of a material with a band gap. And that is based on the fact 
that there is an angular dependence on the scattering. So you can describe graphene as having, on the average, a band gap. And this is a trick that electrical engineers and device physicists use to apply all the developed theories for conventional semiconductors to graphene. You consider that you have uh, a valence, a conductual band with an effective gap. I just bring it up just to, to show that there are other ways of thinking about graphene. So we already heard about the fantastic properties of graphene. And here is a set of properties that are of particular interest in electronics. Uh, the high mobility, uh, the fact that you can tune the current as we saw by a gate field, the ultra thin body of the device, the ability to carry very high carrier densities, uh, excellent thermal conductivity, that's very important, and the large optical absorption. But I should stress that when we are interested in the intrinsic properties of a material, we try to decouple it as much as possible from the environment. Now, graphene is a single atomic layer. It's all surface. So it interacts very strongly with the environment. When you do basic physics, you use low temperatures, you suspend the graphene, and so on. When you want to have applications, the application itself would determine what the environment should be. Of course, almost all devices work at room temperature or higher. Uh, they are encapsulated in, inside complex structures. So it is important to understand that interactions with the environment can drastically change most of these properties. And Professor Geim uh, stressed that point. Uh, here just list types of uh, scattering mechanisms, for example, that are important in transport. Oh, sorry. Uh, scattering by impurities. And the impurities typically are not in graphene. They are on the substrate that you place graphene on. These are charged impurities. We use insulators, which are notorious for trapping charges. Uh, and they are long range scatterers. They tend to dominate transport in graphene. Neutral defects, short range scatterers can be important and, of course, invalidate a lot of the things we said about absence of back scattering and so on because they distort the structure, the local structure of graphene. Uh, charge transfer between an absorbed out of mode to the substrate and so on. Can it use doping, change the chiral concentration and scattering? Surface roughness can be very important. And then we have inelastic scattering mechanisms, of course, phonons of the graphene itself. Uh, something that is usually neglected is in discussions is the graphene has a very high optical phonon frequency, something like five times higher than that of gallium arsenide. So Typically, the scattering in electronic devices as dominated by optical phonons is not very strong in graphene. However, we have new scattering mechanisms, such as coupling of the conduction electrons with uh, the surface phonons of the polar substrate. They are always present, even in conventional devices, but the field is generated decays exponentially away from the surface. And in a finite thickness electronic device, that field has decayed. But graphene is a one atomic layer, so it's right smack at that surface of the polar insulator. That leads to dumping. So at the end, the mobility that you measure is uh, determined by all, by some of all these scattering mechanisms. So if you want to have applications, especially in a complex structure, you have to evaluate and control all these different uh, scattering mechanisms to get a reproducible as you need for an application to result. The other 
very important aspect is bringing in the carriers and taking them out. Uh, transporting graphene may be great, but how are we going to bring in those carriers and take them out? And that is the issue of contacts. Uh, the traditional way of measuring the resistance of contacts uh, is shown here. You just make a channel uh, of different channels of different length, and you measure the resistance. Then you plot the resistance as a function of channel length, and you extrapolate to zero channel length. This is called the transfer length method. And you find that for graphene. Uh, the zero length resistance depends very strongly on the gate voltage you apply. Uh, you, and you can see it here, contact resistance versus uh, gate bias. Uh, of course, the resistance is highest near the Dirac point. But on top of that, you also have a temperature dependence. Contact resistance in graphene is temperature dependent. The key conclusion is, uh, this is for a palladium metal contact, and as far as I know, actually, this is the smallest contact resistance observed so far, which is 200 ohms micron. That's a very large resistance. And if you go closer to the Dirac point, it can be kilo ohms. So the contact resistance is comparable to the resistance of the channel itself and can dominate the performance. So let's see where this resistance comes from. Uh, we have graphene on an insulator. We deposit a metal contact. So the first thing that happens is graphene and the metal have different work functions. So there would be a change of charge, charge transfer. So <coughs> the graphene will be doped. As a result of that doping, there will be a dipole layer formation that the carriers have to cross. It's one barrier. The, they also have to propagate a finite distance under the contact, that's the transfer length. And then exiting in the channel, they will find graphene that is differently doped because it hasn't been doped by the metal. So you will have a doping junction akin to a PN junction in a semiconductor device. So at the end, these carriers encounter a number of blocks. And you can understand that looking at the Rolf Landauer's resistance, contact resistance, which would be proportional to a transmission coefficient. This is the sum of these processes. And the number of modes, one of modes that carry the current, and that's determined by doping. And of course, uh, the doping is here and the, different from there, so whichever is the smaller number of modes uh, will dominate. The other important aspect is, depending on what this transfer length is, will determine how small you can make device, uh, because in electronics, you have a pitch for the device, a spacing. And if your contacts are request, required to be big, you, you don't gain much by making the active channel small. So you have to minimize both of them. And one can generate a, a simple model that will describe the propagation under the metal and the transmission in terms, describe it in terms of two lengths, the mean free path under the graphene and a coupling length that depends on the interaction between graphene and the metal. And sometimes this actually, uh, you want to minimize that kind of, uh, of ratio. Uh, of course, in electronics, the game is scaling, making things smaller and smaller. And uh, we talked about the bond <coughs> structure of graphene. Uh, we have a symmetry between electron and whole states. But if you take uh, 
some graphene. Uh, in this case, the sample was from chemical vapor deposition graphene with palladium contacts. Uh, you measure the resistance versus gate bias uh, at uh, a large channel length, 240 nanometers. You get an almost symmetric resistance voltage curve. And then you can start scaling it, and you see that it becomes more and more asymmetric. And eventually you get uh, at 40 nanometers a very asymmetric shape, and on top of it you start seeing oscillations. As the length changes, uh, of course the transport mechanism changes. And uh, at this point, actually, we are in the ballistic regime. So now electrons, actually, I should say ballistic. Uh, we are in the coherent regime. And now electrons can interfere and give us these Fabry Perot like oscillations. Uh, the behavior can under be understood very easily, considering that palladium, which has high work function, P dops graphene. Uh, so when we apply a positive bias, we create a P and P junction, and what I saw you before, that will lead to resistance, and uh, uh, the asymmetry comes from the contacts. So the electric characteristics are really dominated by the contact. And you can see that uh, visually uh, using near field source circuit photoconductivity of a uh, graphene palladium system. You measure the photoconductivity bringing in with a tip a light source and you scan it along the channel. You see the contacts here for negative uh, gate bias. We have a band structure that looks like these. So you have a P, P prime, P kind of band structure, you apply a positive uh, voltage, and you can see the formation of P and P junctions. Uh, of course, depending on the detailed transport mechanism inside the uh, graphene, you, the properties, the dependence of properties changes. For example, here I uh, saw so dependence of uh, mobility uh, on carrier density, you know, ballistic of course, we're talking about ballistic conductance proportional to the square root. For Coulombic barrier uh, scatterers, we have a mobility that's independent of the carrier density, but for impurity scattering, we have one over n. In general, in the diffusive regime, the properties depend on what kind of impurities or scatterers you have. Uh, that uh, brings to, again, the electrical engineer's point of view. Uh, electrical engineers have been trying for a long time to understand shorter and shorter devices, particularly in 3.5s. And uh, they have come very close to ballistic regime. Uh, there is always some scattering. And they, we know about mobility, uh, the normal mobility we all talk, uh, which is proportional to the mean free path. But once you start having ballistic mobility, then they introduce a somewhat artificial term called ballistic mobility. And this is based on the fact that the mean free path can never be smaller than the channel length because you have the contacts, which are scattering. So, and they write the effective mobility uh, in terms of Matheson's rule. Uh, so, in that formulation of the problem, in scale devices, uh, mobility, high mobility doesn't play a role. Everything saturates. So, for example, if you start with a mobility, normal mobility of 10,000, the mean free path is 160 nanometers. So uh, the ballistic mobility will be only uh, 600, and the effective mobility uh, would be about 
570. If you uh, go to 100,000, you still get 600 mobility. So this is something to consider. The effect of the contacts is paramount. Uh, taking uh, a graphene that's made by CVD and has poor properties, uh, say a mobility about 1,000, and looking at the minimum conductivity as a function of the aspect ratio of the device width over length, you see that already uh, at the aspect ratio of 25, which is about 50 nanometers, but even earlier, we are very close to a uh, theoretically predicted ballistic limit. So if we are talking about scale devices, we don't have to worry that much about uh, mobility. Okay. And there are some other reasons that we we'll get to that. Uh, what we have to worry is, of course, getting good graphene, large area, wafer scale graphene. And there have been several approaches in the growth of graphene. <coughs> One uh, uh, introduced back in uh, 75 in, uh, at the Phillips labs uh, involves taking silicon carbide heating it at high temperature, 15, 1600 degrees, where silicon evaporates, and the carbon atoms that are left behind reorganize to form a graphene layer. Uh, and this is uh, an AFM image of such a uh, graphene type of uh, sample. At the high temperatures used, typically you get a bunching of steps and uh, flat terraces. And you can measure uh, the whole mobility of such a sample. Uh, here's the mobility versus uh, carrier density. And uh, the whole mobility curve can be uh, understood in terms of a combination of Coulomb and short terrain scattering. The point is that we have a strong uh, carrier density dependence and you can get high mobilities at low carrier densities. But for electronic devices, you have to work at higher densities because you need to have at least milliamp mic per micron currents. Uh, topography plays a very important role. And this is, again, the same image that I show you. And the point is that uh, if you, by making devices in different orientations within the steps, you find that a single step, uh, this is about 10 nanometers high, this is a bunched step, can introduce uh, resistances of the or order of 10 kilo ohm uh, micro. So topography is important. Uh, also, point effects in graphene play a role. They affect the temperature dependence of the carrier density. I won't discuss, it's too complicated. But there are specific defects in silicon carbide with an, an energy of about 70 million electron volts. Another big technical problem is that uh, graphene is inert. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a polar, inert, so if you want to deposit, as in other normal semiconductors, an insulator, it's very difficult. It doesn't nucleate properly. So if you want to put, for example, half new dioxide, uh, here's 10 nanometers uh, of half new dioxide, and you can see there are many, many gaps. Uh, initially nucleates at uh, steps and defects, and it's never very homogeneous unless you go to very high coverage. And of course, you want the thinnest possible films. So as a result of that, you need to do something to the surface, usually sort of prime it with something. Uh, this is one example early on. We used a, a polymer, a very thin seed layer of polymer, which covers uniformly the surface, and then use atomic layer deposition to complete and then you get a good smooth surface. 
So the question now is, how do you use graphene in electronics? Okay. Uh, we know it's a zero gap semiconductor. We cannot completely confine them. A typical on-off ratio of the current in graphene is of the order of 10, 20, depending on the quality of uh, the graphene. But to make digital devices, you need at least 10 to the 4. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, pristine graphene cannot be used for the kinds of things silicon can do. However, we have a finite current ratio. We have high carrier mobilities and drive currents and thrust conductance, which suggest that uh, graphene can be ideal for analog <coughs> applications, particularly fast applications, RF. And these applications are very widespread, and they are growing these days, because everything that involves wireless communications, from cell phones to radars, sensors, biomedical imaging, security at airports, involves very high frequency transistors and amplifiers. So there is a big demand for this. And high-end devices in that regime are not like silicon devices. They are very expensive. They cannot be produced massively, except the lower frequencies. They are hand-selected and very, very pricey. Uh, so here's uh, an example of a structure of a transistor uh, for a ref application based on graphene. Uh, we grow graphene on uh, full wafers and uh, uh, make the devices. This was made out of silicon carbide. I mentioned. And uh, here are some typical results of uh, graphene devices. At this point, we're operating at high frequency, so we cannot use resistances and con uh, other things uh, to describe the material because everything is mixed in capacitance, inductance, resistance. So we describe the operation of the device in terms of uh, wave propagation, the so-called S-matrix approach. And we can defy, uh, define a number of metrics, for example, the current gain, and another important uh, 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 metric is the so-called cutoff frequency, F sub t, which is the frequency at which the current gain becomes one, that is, we stop having current gain. And if we measure the current gain, versus frequency for here two devices. One is uh, 550 nanometer channel length, the other is smaller, 240. You see first that there is scaling. That is, as you uh, decrease the channel length, the cutoff frequency increases. Uh, this is uh, at room temperature with a rather modest mobility of about 1500. And uh, already at 240, you can uh, reach 100 uh, gigahertz. That's, that was significant because uh, if you were trying to do that with silicon with the same channel length, uh, you will probably get no more than 40 gigahertz. Now, the typical procedure, of course, is to start decreasing the channel length and already uh, silicon is at 22 nanometers, uh, an order of magnitude smaller. Uh, but instead of doing that, uh, I will go back, huh, it's the same foil that I had before, and uh, remind you this, that there is a strong topography dependence and try to make devices a little bit more carefully. So here we make the device to make sure that lies on a single terrace, that no steps are crossed. And when you do that, then you look again at the scaling and at the same length, 210 was 240 before, so uh, as close as possible, we see that now we have doubled the uh, F sub t, so we have cutoff now at uh, 210 gigahertz. 
And uh, as I said, the currents are very good. We have uh, drain currents of over two uh, milliamps per micron and looks promising. Uh, another thing that needs to be done to increase the performance is to decrease these spaces, the ungated regions. They add the resistance, but we cannot overlap the gate, the source and drain, because the capacitance, parasitic capacitance, will come in and slow the device down. So. Uh, the fact that graphene doesn't, uh, insulators don't nucleate in graphene can be used to make something called self-aligned gating. And I want this to technical. Uh, another approach that can be used and we started using uh, is uh, graphene by CBD. We saw examples already. The advantage here is that unlike silicon carbide, it saturates at monolayer. Only very small portions can, around defects, can become double layers. And uh, the, the great thing about it is that you can now grow single graphene crystals, like this uh, called graphene snowflake. Uh, it's an expensive, uh, the most important thing, and you just use copper foils. You can get any copper foil, put it with a hydrocarbon, uh, a methane, ethylene, whatever, and make the graphene. The key uh, advantage is that then you can <laughs> peel that graphene and paste it on anywhere you want. Uh, for example, you can put it on a polymer, uh, a transparent polymer, uh, or in our case, you can put it on silicon wafers up to eight inch uh, wafers. I think Professor Hong will discuss this technique probably very extensively. Uh, the next worry is heating, uh, which is currently the major roadblock in silicon electronics. Uh, power dissipation limits the growth. These days you don't get more powerful chips because of the heat dissipation. As the density increases, you cannot cope with the power. And we have used Raman thermometry to look at these effects on graphene. And as you can see, as you increase the electrical power, you get very large temperature increases. And you can see it in a color map here as we increase the drain bias, uh, how hot the graphene gets. And uh, there's also some degree of anisotropy in the heating because obviously the middle gets hotter than the edges. And uh, if you try to simulate the heat dissipation, you see, of course, near the contacts, you have efficient dissipation. But for a long device, there is extreme heating and for this particular geometry, we find that about 70% of the power is dissipated into the substrate. So that uh, uh, is a key question then, where do you want to place graphene if you have the ability to peel it off and put it on anything you want? Uh, so. The properties of the substrate, uh, of course, you want something for commercial applications to be readily available, uh, compatible with wafer scale coverage. Uh, you don't want to have uh, charge traps, which are the main problem with silicon dioxide. Uh, you don't want to uh, have something hydrophilic because water oxygen system on SiO2 and other polar insulators are the causes of doping, and you want, of course, high thermal conductivity. Uh, that made us conclude that maybe diamond type of films, sp3 carbon, which like diamond itself is known to have very high thermal conductivity, being nonpolar and having all these other uh, properties, is used extensively to cover um, uh, memory, uh, hard disks, and so on, is uh, 
possibility. So we try that. Um, here I gained results with CVD graphene. We are not very good at growing CVD graphene yet, so mobilities are of the order of a thousand. But uh, here we saw the scaling for CVD graphene. Um, 550 nanometers, we get uh, 26 gigahertz. Uh, 140, 70 gigahertz, all of course at room temperature, and at uh, uh, 40 nanometers, 155 gigahertz. So uh, you can see that uh, we had no problems whatsoever with uh, doping or uh, moisture or traps or anything. And uh, uh, improving the quality of the graphene, this looks extremely promising. The other thing is we looked at the temperature dependence of uh, uh, these devices. So we measured for the first time the frequency, uh, the F sub T, uh, from room temperature to liquid helium. And as you can see, there is hardly any difference in these devices for all lengths, which implies that graphene has another excellent property. Uh, there is no carrier freeze out. So you can use it, uh, at, for example, even in uh, space without having any deterioration of properties. So that, that looks very encouraging. Of course, uh, cutoff frequency is not the only one, the only interesting thing. You have to have power. The applications that graphene has to uh, displace uh, generate power. There are amplifiers. The, for internet, we need stations that will be used to transmit movies, big files. And for that, you need power. And that is more difficult. Uh, for reasons not intrinsic to graphene. But it's getting there. We started getting uh, unilateral power gain that is comparable to uh, F sub T. How do we optimize the graphene devices and circuits? Basically what you need is self-gain for graphene to be useful. And self-gain is the ratio of transconductance and output conductance. Unfortunately, these two quantities go in opposite direction. <coughs> you want the output conductance to be to tend to zero. That is, you want this curve to be flat. You need the, the transconductance to go to infinity. So you want maximum slope. It turns out that this is, goes faster. So uh, as in other semiconductor devices, you need current saturation. That is, the current has to reach a certain value and remain flat as a function of drain bias. Uh, in, I'll, I'll discuss this. So what we need is good mobility, good gating to increase the transconductance. We need current saturation to increase the output conductance. We need good dielectrics, high K dielectrics to affect the current saturation. And as I mentioned, self-aligned junctures to minimize the so-called access resistance. For circuits, you also require to minimize the contact resistance. That enters in the gain, power gain. Uh, if, you co if you optimize uh, the gating, then you can start getting current saturation that you need, and you also increase a lot the uh, transconductance. Uh, this is just uh, some simulations that show how critical the contact resistance is. If you have F sub T is a function of channel length for different contact resistance, you see how fast 
the performance drops as a function of the contact resistance, really dominates the performance. Uh, then, of course, the next step is to try to integrate devices. Graphene is planar material, so it's easy to fabricate, well, easier than some other material to fabricate individual devices. But then you have, in circuits, you have to fabricate not only the transistors, but all the passive elements, inductors, capacitors, and so on, on graphene. So there you have to develop patterning techniques that can operate on graphene, and there are adhesion problems and other things. So just one example of making a unipolar frequency mixer uh, uh, that involves inductors and other components on graphene And uh, a frequency mixer is, of course, you put two frequencies in, and you generate some and different frequencies uh, in every radio and every place, because you want to have a high frequency, but to process it at a lower frequency. So uh, this is our graphene transistors, our symbol for graphene transistors. So you, you bring in one frequency and another, here they are, the local oscillator and the RF, and you generate the sum and the uh, difference. And now you have taken uh, a four gigahertz frequency and made it 200 megahertz you can easily process. The advantage of graphene in this case, this is not optimized by far, but the advantage of this particular design is that first it works even in heavily doped samples that don't, don't so direct point, and it has superior thermal stability. Uh, it, it operates even at higher temperatures without loss, unlike conventional semiconductors. So uh, probably I'm running late. Uh, I should jump to a little bit of the optical properties and how we can use it. Uh, uh, graphene, the many body effects uh, are not very strong, so we can imagine the optical absorption, a single particle transition, an interband transition. We already heard about the universal optical absorption, uh, <coughs> which is, we'll see, to some extent frequency independent. It's about 2.3% uh, 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 for normal incidence for free graphene. Uh, for multi-layers, uh, for energies above about half a volt, it's additive, so by looking at an absorption spectrum, you can get uh, how many layers. And then we have also intraband <coughs> transition, which is the Druda type of transition in the very uh, far IR. Uh, that can directly provide you the carrier density of graphene. And then you have an additional property uh, that uh, first uh, described by Professor Kim, uh, the polyblocking, which is simply the fact that uh, you know if you don't have states, uh, your Fermi level is there, there is no absorption. So by tuning the Fermi level by a gate, you can tune what wavelengths will be absorbed. Uh, the absorption spectrum of graphene over a very wide energy range provided by Tony Hines uh, of Columbia is shown here. You see, it's a, of course, it's a semi-metal, so it absorbs over the entire region. Uh, in the visible and near IR, the absorption is uh, relatively constant, about 2.3%, as we said. Uh, up here, you have a plasmonic effects that complicate uh, uh, the picture. But in general, it's high. Uh, for us, the most interesting part is the far IR, where we have uh, Drude absorption that can get very high. Uh, if we take uh, graphene, uh, we see the characteristic uh, Drude behavior with frequency. We can chemically dope it and increase it, up, in this case, up to 40% of the incident light. 
and you can use it uh, diagnostically if you want. <coughs> uh, here is uh, over in the mid IR the absorption. Uh, from this type of spectrum, you can get the Fermi energy by the poly blocking, as I mentioned. Uh, you can dope it chemically, and you see that the poly blocking moves far out of the region that we can probe. So that uh, uh, leads to an increased absorption in the Druder regime and a decrease in the uh, mid IR visible because we have an oscillator strength sum rule. Uh, for us, uh, the first application we explore in photonics is uh, that of photodetectors. Photodetectors, of course, look a little bit uh, unusual for graphene given that uh, it doesn't have a band gap. But uh, when we did uh, photoconductivity experiments <coughs> where we put graphene, source and drain electrodes, but didn't apply a bias between them, brought in the light uh, with an optical tip in uh, near field microscopy, and scanned the, the light over the surface of graphene and detected the, uh, the uh, photocurrent. We saw that the photocurrent was uh, localized around the contacts. And if you think about it, uh, we mentioned at the very beginning that metal in contact with graphene will create charge transfer. And that charge transfer, of course, will lead to band bending. And the band bending will create a local electric field. So uh, near the contacts, if we radiate near the contact, there would be a band bending, which we can manipulate with a gate without applying a drain bias. So if we excite one contact, uh, the electron hole pairs that are produced will be separated by this intrinsic field, built-in field, and we get a photocard. And uh, if we excite the entire device, the, the, we get nothing because the field acts in opposite directions at the two contacts, so there is no net field. But if you excite near one contact, then you get a photocar. So we decided to use this as a photo uh, detector. Advantage, of course, of course, is because we don't need to apply a drain bias, we have no dark current and therefore low shot noise. So we did that in measuring photoconductivity. Uh, these are uh, results of uh, the photoresponse and photoresponsivity uh, for 1.5 micron light, which is used in optical communications, as a function of the modulation frequency of the light. And the, the highest frequency we can measure in our lab with the equipment we have is 40 gigahertz. And as you see, the photoresponse is essentially flat. The little decrease that you see comes actually from the cables, not the graphene. And if we measure the photoresponsivity, uh, DC and high frequency essentially they coincide. This tells us that uh, the graphene photo detectors are very fast. Uh, the, my postdoc went back to Austria and tells me that through an optical technique now he can measure up to 270 gigahertz with no problem. So uh, the advantage here of course is that you have a universal type of photo detector that is responsive to just about every frequency. The disadvantage is that because of the single atomic layer, uh, the current you get, the photoresponse, is not very high. It cannot compete, say, with three fives. But 
and also we have the problem that we have to radiate near the contact. So the first thing we wanted to do is correct that problem. So typically then, if we have two electrodes of identical metal, the potential will look like this, the red, symmetric. And as I said, left and right will cancel out. But if you use two metals with different work functions, they will lead to different bond bending. And so we made structures like this in the digitated electrodes, one with uh, a high and low work function metal like titanium, another with high work function like palladium. And then we have the gate, no applied bias. Uh, for an arbitrary gate, we have cancellation again of the photocurrents. But tuning the gate, we can get to a regime where we have positive contributions only. And as a result, you can first irradiate the whole area, so you have a large detection area, and you get a 15 times enhancement in the photoresistivity. This is not the end, of course, because one could first make more layers, uh, but also you can enhance the absorption of graphene coupling to plasmons, for example. There are many ways of doing that with silicon waveguides, uh, noble metals, even to plasmons of graphene itself. And then you can get very high absorbance and uh, performance. And to test this, we applied it to uh, uh, optical communications. So we used the graphene photo detector to uh, detect an optical signal again at the uh, communications frequencies and uh, use eye diagrams to check how faithfully uh, the interpretation of the optical data uh, is done. And we, again, limited only by uh, our ability to measure high frequencies, we could measure up to 10 gigabits per second internet rate uh, with the photo, uh, uh, graphene photo detector. So uh, these are some of the things we are doing. Uh, I wanted to, uh, some conclusions. Uh, I really feel that uh, graphene can have many important applications in both electronics and photonics. Uh, the key advantages, in my opinion, are the excellent transport and optical properties, the thinness. Uh, something that uh, is not stressed enough, in my opinion, is the possibility of low price and ease of fabrication. Uh, people always compare with their fives and so on, uh, which are established technologies but expensive require a BE or other system, difficult systems, expensive systems. I think particularly CVD graphene can bring a tremendous advantage there. Another great advantage, which again, conventional semiconductors don't share, is integration with silicon technology. Graphene cannot be used in isolation because you don't have the digital part, uh, but it can be integrated with silicon technology. The critical issues is material. We need high quality, large area, homogeneous, and low price graphene. We need control toppings. We need low resistance contacts and gates, and good insulators. And also, I believe that we need more science, particularly science of graphene and interaction under what I would call real life conditions. Anyway, I would like to <laughs> thank all of my collaborators, <laughs> to so remain unnamed, <laughs> uh, and also IBM and DARPA for the support uh, of uh, the project. And thank you for your attention. You mentioned that mobility of electrons in graphene can be measured at small distances. 
od cirka 50 nanometers. Is it isotropic or may depend on the direction? I think it would be isotropic. I mean, uh, uh, first I didn't say that really it would be very small. It, 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 won't, it doesn't have physical meaning because in very small dimensions, basically it's ballistic. Uh, the concept of ballistic mobility is sort of artificial. Uh, but I don't think where you can measure mobility I would be an isotropic. Unless the, the, there are some, there is one report at least, but it's a very structured surface. Uh, in silicon carbide, people have uh, done measurements with tips, metallic tips. So put down the tip in one point and the circle, circle with the other and they find an isotropy. But that is because the impurities in the silicon carbide are anisotropically distributed. They tend to uh, collect near steps and things, so there's no, but intrinsically graphite should not be anisotropic. Yeah, I'm Norbert Klein, Imperial College London. The FT values you were reporting for the transistors are very impressive forever. They're still well below the values you can achieve in gallium, arsenide, indium, phosphide. Yes. What is the physical limitation? I mean, you said that the, the mobility doesn't play a role. It's limited by the uh, geometrical dimension anyway. Yes. The, it's a matter of time. You're comparing a technology that uh, you know developed over 40 years versus one that's uh, less than a year old. Uh, nothing is optimized. And uh, there are still issues with the substrate, uh, the gates. Uh, I think the insulator is a major problem still. And the quality of graphene is not uh, reproducible and up to par. So individual devices, uh, I don't see any intrinsic limitation, uh, but uh, I, I, that's why I stress, in my opinion, uh, the goal is not to go to <coughs> 400, 500 gigahertz. There are reports of uh, germanium devices going to 700, okay. Uh, the applications there are very minimal. May I add one more question? Is it a realistic vision to think about, a, let's say, RFID, plastic electronic with graphene, or is that? Yes, yes. The, my, my feeling is uh, that the major uh, advantage of graphene is simplicity and price. And the sweet spot, if you want, for applications is in the range of 50 to 60 gigahertz. Uh, there is a market for very high frequencies for military applications. Don't forget that the propagation of electromagnetic waves is limited by the atmosphere. Uh, they, for point-to-point -point secret communications, you can use very high frequencies. But for long distance, you can't. Uh, and the frequencies are controlled. So I wouldn't say that graphene has a future in cell phones because there you cannot improve anything really. Everything is controlled. The frequency, the power you can use because of health effects. So it is primarily internet, uh, diagnostics, terahertz for imaging. Uh, I can't tell you all our <laughs> plans, but uh, uh, I don't think the the search for higher and higher frequencies is the ultimate goal. Because Thanks, companies have to make money, and if the market is small, although needs develop as potentialities appear. What is special about palladium as a contact? Is it just high density of states? Uh, well, it's, uh, you need a metal that uh, is stable. Uh, you don't want it to be oxidizable. You cannot uh, use copper or anything like that. Uh, so it has, uh, it's noble. It has a high work function. Uh, it sticks well to uh, graphene. I, I, 
mention about charge transfer and so on, but most metals will not stop a charge transfer, will actually hybridize with graphene and make it an insulator. So uh, it, by sort of trial and error, we came up with as the best metal for us. Uh, people have also used titanium. We have used titanium too. Uh, the, there are other possibilities, but I think for us, the optimal metal also price. I mean, gold is not good, and is at these days extremely expensive. So palladium is the best compromise. Uh, Nathaniel Rim from University. Sorry, uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, potential applications talk so far. Which one excites you personally the most at the moment? Which one are you most excited about at the moment? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I came from the optics field, so maybe I'm um, interested more in the optics intrinsically, but that's the... Uh, I work for IBM, and IBM is not into optics. <laughs> uh, and I'm supported by DARPA. Uh, which interested only in uh, high frequency. So, what I'm interested in, what reality is, <laughs> working in industry is different than in university. Um, I'll focus on University of Sheffield. I'm trying to understand the um, optical ah. absorption spectrum you show from Tony Heinz. Yeah. Um, so if I remember the one which uh, was measured in Manchester, it was more or less completely flat across the visible yes. spectrum, it is. if that's, I don't know if Andre can confirm that, and yet the one you were showing from Tony Heinz clearly has a big yeah, absorption in the were, blue and... Yeah, I thought so what's the very difference? large energy rates. So the, the flatness appears in the visible and near IR. Okay, uh, but the spectrum you showed was clearly in the blue, it's already, the absorption yes, is going up quite a lot. I mean, you don't have single particle transitions over there. Uh, it has been described by some theorists as a result of uh, excitonic interactions. I, they may be there, uh, but traditionally that part of the spectrum has been considered as plasmonic. But, okay. Yeah, we did measure before Tony Heights, it's, it's in Israel B or white range. And, uh, and we, we see the same essentially. Some samples show flat and visible frequencies, other broader peak, but the peak is there, sometimes narrow, then it gives flat, sometimes broader. Look, Kravitz and Alphys are big, what, just before this paper by Tony Hanks. Yeah. That peak has been traditionally used as a probe of how doped graphite is. Uh, it shifts very strongly, and there are sensors based on that absorption. And as I mentioned, also the intensity by some rule of conservation yeah, is a measure of the density, carrier density, in both graphite and graphene. And photoelectron spectroscopy is used at peak all the time to test uh, graphenization and so on. Uh, in the old days, we did surface science. Always, you see the needles and other techniques. It's always there from carbon separated from transition metals and so on. Uh, 